Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Crimes and Times. Only a few moments ago, the Atlanta District Attorney rendered a decision on prosecuting the police officers involved in the shooting of Mr. Brooks. We all know which story that was, where he turned and shot uh, Taser at the officers. We're going to break that down with a subject matter expert uh, step by step, and please pay attention because a number of things you probably haven't thought about. Joining us tonight is Duncan Larson. He spent several years as a police officer. He's been involved as a subject matter expert and trainer in the use of force, defensive tactics, and weapons. He's now a civilian employee of a federal agency, and we want to point out that all opinions that he expresses now are his own and not that of his employer. Welcome, Duncan. Nice to see you, Michael, again. Yeah, I have to tell you that you, you're a record breaker. You're the first person to appear for a third time in Crimes and Times. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So let's go step by step. We all kind of know the story of uh, the officer, Mr. Brooks, and what culminated in a deadly exchange that then culminated in the prosecution of two police officers. First, we see, at least from the tapes, the officers talking to Mr. Brooks. And they're having both of the, both parties to calm, the police and Mr. Brooks. What happens then? Well, it looks like, you know, from what I saw in the video, the, the couple of videos that I was able to see that everybody else saw, you know, kind of a normal, what I would say, DUI, DUI investigation, you know, that we've done right. thousands of times a day uh, throughout the country. And, you know, it seemed like they were just going to place handcuffs on him and uh, arrest him either physically take him to jail or issue a citation that would have to be determined based on what happened, you know, and they kind of went to put handcuffs on him and then a struggle ensued and uh, looked like to me a pretty violent uh, encounter between okay, the two me, officers. Okay, let me stop you there for a second. Let sure. me stop you there for a second. Because here I'm looking at what people are telling me on social media, in my conversations, and just what's being discussed in regular media. So the officers had reasonable suspicion, probable cause for DWI. Hmm. Was that arrest legal? I mean, if they have reasonable, you know, suspicion, well, if they had probable cause, they did feel sobriety on him. Uh, as we see, they gave him, uh, you know, several tests and the officers determined that he didn't perform those tests well. And yes, if they felt that he was impaired and uh, were going to affect a arrest, they absolutely have the right to detain him and arrest him at that point. All right. And I've heard even former law enforcement officers saying, just get him another, you know, let him go, call, call, give him a ride home. I have people telling me, why didn't they just call Uber for him? What are your thoughts on that as a, as having been a police officer, probably in that situation? Well, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's a catch 22, right? The, the police are in any city in the United States and any jurisdiction are going to be held responsible no matter what the decision is they made. Somebody's not going to be happy. Uh, if you choose to get him an Uber and let him go, and he decides to, after the police leave, get in a vehicle and drive, and he hurts somebody or kills somebody because he's impaired, that's on the police officers as well. So uh, you just can't let somebody go. Uh, whether you're going to give them a citation, impound the car, um, have them dropped off with a family member after they've been arrest, arrested, arrest is either by citation or to jail, or they could take him to jail. That's determined by the suspects, uh, usually for me, the suspects, um, demeanor, which he looked like he was pretty cooperative until he actually went. To right. But in a DWI, and I'm going back many years from when I was a police officer, uh, I'm much older than you probably don't. Yeah. I'm going back many years. Uh, when we arrested someone for DWI, we could not, we were not given the option of letting them go for many reasons you just discussed. Mm. But I remember we had to bring them in and give them a blood alcohol test. Absolutely. But that was evidence. You can't do that if you don't bring them in. Absolutely. I mean, he's going to be detained more than likely. And I don't know what machines they're using now. It's been, uh, you know, 13, 14 years since I've done that. 40, but, 40, 40 for me. Yeah. <laughs> so usually they're going to give them a certified like intoxilizer test, the little portable test they give you uh, in, on the field sobriety. That's just to give the officer an estimation of where they're at. It cannot be used in a court a lot. The official intoxilizer or a breath test they have either at the police department or a substation or at the jail that you go to, that's the official um, reading. So that's what, if they had placed handcuffs on him and put him in the car, that's where he was going to go is to get the official uh, test. And their reading came out to over 0.10, did it not? If 
I re remember correctly from the facts? I, I maybe don't quote me on that because I don't remember exactly okay. what it is, but over whatever their legal limit legal was. Limit. And I recall again from my, my time as an officer that when you're over the legal limit, there was a judicial presumption that yes. you were intoxicated. So even let's say he passed the field sobriety tests where they do the walk and turn and whatever tests they have in that state, I have arrested people that were two, three times the legal limit in my state, and they passed those tests with flying colors. Um, but the eye test, the, the nystagmus test, that can't be faked unless you have a severe head injury, uh, traumatic brain injury. So usually that's what you base uh, your probable cause on the rest for. Um, and somewhat what the portable breath test tells you, it gives you a, a zone um, of where they're going to be at. Okay, a couple of points I want to bring down because as we talk, I'm trying to write my notes here, keep up with us. So they made a legal arrest. Yes. And what you and I just discussed, probably a necessary arrest if they believe he was DWI. Yes. Right? For, for these reasons. So they're all cooperative. They go to arrest him. And we see them, just one of the officers especially, placing, trying to get his arms behind him. I hear, again, experts say the police need to de-escalate. At that point, what was there to de-escalate and who actually escalated it into a violent confrontation? Yeah, no, I mean, it, actually, they almost had one handcuff on him from what I had saw, and it looked like a straight up, they were going to put the handcuffs off on him, and then that was going to be it. Um, I think in his head, from what you can see, there's that moment with everybody where they go, wow, this is, I'm getting arrested, and then he made a decision to pull away, and then the officers obviously are going to try and affect that arrest physically because that's the only way it can be done um and then it kind of spiraled out of control from there uh so that's so in your opinion do you think the police escalated this by placing him under arrest no i mean they didn't i know from the press conference they didn't officially say you are under arrest but they said uh you're over the legal limit or you're intoxicated something like that i can't right. absolutely remember right. what it is right now um and going to place handcuffs on it. It's kind of inferred uh, at that point, but it's up to him to cooperate at that point. Uh, right. So resisting an arrest is an offense of itself. Exactly. It's, it's, a, it's another crime. So he's committing a crime at that point. Uh, so that's kind of where it spiraled into is the physical confrontation at that point. Right. Now, going back to what you and I were just discussing about the police officer's obligation to maybe not let him leave if they think he's intoxicated as opposed to take him to custody, because they're responsible for his actions. Several years ago, there's a well-known case here in Kansas City. You may or may not have heard of it, heard of it with uh, Joe Von Belcher. Did that ring a bell to you at all? Okay, no, it, it was big around here. Uh, former football player, uh, killed his girlfriend. Actually, I do remember that. Okay, right. And the big question City, right? was, I'm sorry? He played for Kansas City Chiefs, right? Right, right. You're here? Yeah, okay, I remember that. And, yeah, I might mention we have the Kansas City Chiefs. Did I mention that? <laughs> World champions, all right. <laughs> there you go. All right. Anyway, uh, he, he uh, killed his girlfriend that night. And the big issue that came up, and I spoke on every channel, you know, every local media station here about it, was the fact that the officer stopped him. He was in his car, mm -hmm. uh, I think outside her place before that, sometime before that. And I don't recall if the car was running or not. But they took him out, they spoke to him, and they let him go. Mm -hmm. And then the question was, did the police do the right thing? Because he was drunk, and was that alcohol, you know, part of what made him so violent? Then should the police have arrested him and avoided this? I looked over those tapes pretty carefully. I did not see any signs at the time, if I recall, that he was intoxicated or anything that would warrant them taking him into custody. So I, mm -hmm. I felt they can't predict what's going to happen. No. But to go back to our point, when someone isn't taken into custody and he commits a violent act, we're asking why didn't the police do it when they had the chance? Yes. Aren't we running the same chance here? A man's intoxicated. He could get back in the car. He could come back later and drive. He could hurt somebody. And the question will be, well, why didn't you take him into custody? Yeah. So, so obviously, I agree with you because uh, it's a catch-22 situation uh, at that point if something happens. Now, if nothing happens, then nobody ever knows about it. But, I mean, I, I couldn't let somebody go and then have them be an I probably couldn't live with that if they killed somebody else. That would be totally my fault for failing to do my job at that point. Um, and the, like I said, the way it's going to be handled, he doesn't have to go to jail. You know, the worst case scenario on that DUI is he, he goes to jail and he has to bond out. The best case scenario, if he's being arrested, is he gets a citation and a summons 
a family member comes, picks him up. You know, we don't have the car in play anymore because it's been impounded uh, or whatever. And he still has to appear on that, but that's a several hour process too. So during that, that process, you know, obviously his alcohol level is going to go down um, through that process and like that. So that's the positive side of a citation if they're being, you know, cooperative. So there's two ways to go, but you have to affect the arrest at that point. If you determine that he's a danger, being intoxicated while driving is your danger to yourself and your danger to the public. And so you have to be taken off the street. That's all there is right. to it. And it's a legal, legal you know, lawful arrest. And, and I want to point out to the audience that right now we're just discussing this arrest. We're not saying uh, deadly force was legitimate, not legitimate at this moment, at this point. We're just talking about this transaction, this interaction yes. between the officers and Mr. Brooks. So they take him into custody. He fights, uh, puts up a pretty good fight, obviously, fends off two police officers, grabs a taser, and runs away. Uh, you know, probably the same people saying, well, why didn't you call Uber or anything? They're saying, well, why not just let him go? Well, Duncan, why didn't they just let him go? Well, at that point, you know, once the physical altercation starts, and, you know, you can hear somewhat in the video, you know, they tell him stop resisting, put your hands behind your back, the normal stuff that happens when you're in a physical confrontation with somebody. But uh, Mr. Brooks, his his resistance is amplified. I mean, he is actively in a combative fight with both of them. He's punching the officers in the face. Uh, he's grabbing, you know, items off their utility belts. He's grabbing the taser, which is a weapon. It's the less lethal weapon. It's still a weapon, though. Um, and at that point, what's happening is he's committing more egregious offenses, right? Uh, if you punch a police officer in the face, you're committing assault on a police officer, no matter what state you're in. Depending on what the law is, that could be a misdemeanor assault or it could be a felonious assault. It just depends on that state and the amount of you know force you're using. Uh, when he takes a taser or any object from a police officer, you're disarming the officer of that item, which in itself, depending on what state you're in, is another crime. Um, and I don't know, you know, the Georgia state laws, obviously, because I've never worked there. But as that active fight is going on, it's not like, oh, there's a fight and, and there's no, no ramification from that. Active offenses are being committed at that point and they're becoming uh, more heightened with the amount of force that's being used. So we have resisting arrest, we have resisting arrest with violence, we have you know assault on a police officer, we have disarming a police officer. Um, and so now the misdemeanor of the DUI is basically the most minor offense at this point. And so now the officers really have no choice but to affect the arrest because felonies are now being committed um, as the violence continues. And I think also a point I always make when I'm asked about this is that we give officers a job to do and the law has to be respected. I'm not saying feared, they have to be respected. And if an officer starts to make an arrest and there's resistance, that arrest has to be affected. The officer has to come out on top. He has to win that confrontation. Because just think about every time an officer says you're under arrest, and someone's even for a minor offense, someone says, I don't think so, you're not taking me in. And the officer says, all right, never mind. You know, I'm not allowed to get into fisticuffs with you. What's going to happen to a system? Why now there's a lot of anger at cops, they'll become sort of a, a satirical thing. They'll be like the Keystone cops. Well, we're saying, what's wrong with that police force? They can't take anyone to custody. Are they afraid of everybody? So I think it's important, and I like your opinion, that the officers have to make the arrest once they decide to make the arrest, not for their ego, but for the sake of law and order, for the sake of the system working. Yes. And I mean, like I said, as they're getting more violence, uh, violent events are, you know, spiraling out of control and more crimes are being, um, you know, uh, perpetrated, then you have to make that arrest because now you're dealing with uh, more egregious criminal offenses and you can't just let people, obviously there's people around, they said they have more cameras and they're like, people are seeing that, they're seeing that interaction um, and you can't just let somebody walk away at that point. Right, and I wanna again point out, we haven't discussed the issue of deadly force yet, we're just talking about affecting an arrest. Uh, we're talking about the escalation uh, because I think some of the people that, the commentators and people saying, you know, the police need to de-escalate, I don't think they escalated it. I think he escalated I mean, it when he was placed under lawful arrest. I mean, he they had, what, 40-something minutes of just talking. Yeah. It looked like they were, you know, very cordial with everybody, just kind of doing their job. And, and, you know, it's a regular Saturday night 
for Friday night, whatever night that was for these officers are making an arrest that they probably made hundreds of times for DUI and nothing ever happens because most of the time it goes the, the right way. Right. And we forget how many times out there and I'm sure you can remember some. I remember when I was on the street, someone commits a crime, they try to run away and the officer chases them down. This is probably happening many times every day all over the United States. It's what police do. It's what we ask them to do. Take people into custody. Again, we're not saying you're allowed to use deadly force at that moment. We're just talking about the incident and whether the police responded appropriately at that time. And I think at this point, they're appropriate. Now Brooks takes off with the taser. The officers are in pursuit. And I believe Officer Rolf, I think from the tape, he's the one who had his uh, taser out. Is that how you saw it? I don't know which officers went from looking at the video based well, on the officer who did the shooting. Right? Who but did the yes, shooting? Um, he had his taser. One of them, I don't know which one had their taser taken away. One of them had the taser taken away, and, and the other officer had his out, obviously. Right. So, Officer Rolf, I believe, is the one who had the taser out, uh, is chasing him. And then what happened? What do we know happens? Well, from what it looks like, uh, it looks like Mr. Brooks is running away. Uh, the officer is giving chase. He has his taser out. And at one point, uh, Mr. Brooks turns around and he actually raises his hand up. And, you know, you can't hear what's on the video and you kind of see and it's kind of grainy. But I actually looked like it. You could see the arc of the taser um, being fired. Um, now, from what the district attorney said, he said that the prongs were actually deployed and they went over the head of the officer. So I'm assuming at that point, because uh, I didn't really see that. I just saw the arc right at the front of the taser. Um, I'm presuming that he actually fired the taser and that cartridge hasn't been fired. And it went over the officer's head at that point while he was giving chase. And I think these that's right. Very, these darts are sharp, right? Yeah, they're just like a little fish hook. They're pretty small. And, but they have a lot of impact, right? Uh, yeah, they're, they're made to go through, you know, clothing to try and make contact with the skin. Otherwise, they don't work. So had they hit the officer's face, would you consider that serious bodily injury? Well, absolutely. I mean, let's say it hit you in the eyeball and now you have electricity running through your eyeball. I'm pretty sure you're going to lose vision at that point. Um, and obviously, if he gets the prongs uh, connection on the body, you're going to be incapacitated for the time that the taser is cycling. Does that warrant deadly force? Um, I believe it does. Um, during certain circumstances, if you're in active confrontation, I mean, what's going to happen when you're incapacitated, right? So I used to be a field training officer and I, I would have the rookies come into my vehicle. And the first question I would ask them is a statistics question of how many calls are we going to go on today that involve a firearm, right? So they're thinking, they're trying to think and they say, well, you know what, 5%, right? I'm, I'm working in a small city, not a big city. I said, no, it's extremely larger number than they'd say 10 percent. i'd say no let's get higher 25 percent. no finally i'd get to the point and say hey a hundred percent of the calls we're going to go on today involve a firearm because we're bringing it and even today a large number of officers that are killed by gunfire are killed with their own weapon because the suspect incapacitated them took the weapon away and killed the officer with the weapon so that's the mindset that these officers are in when you were talking about you know uh they need to win the fight that's what these guys are trained on for 10, 15, 20 years of their career. It's you will win so that you'll go home and I'm not going to allow somebody to incapacitate me. In reality, if the suspect is punching you in the face, that's just a happenstance on what's going to happen to you. If he hits you the right way in the face, you could get killed. You could break your orbital socket, break your teeth, break your bones. That's serious bodily injury. Would the officer be justified at that point in using deadly force? Well, if he feels like he's passing out and he's going to be knocked out, He's going to be left there and that, that guy can do anything he wants, right? Yes, in those situations, deadly force is authorized. We have case law that specifically says that from the Supreme Court. All right, very, very interesting. So I heard the district attorney say that one of the things he considered is the fact that the officer who fired, right, wait, let me go back for a second. So the, the taser was shot. Do we know, because I didn't hear it and I didn't see it, uh, you know, time-wise, how quickly the officer returned fire? And I don't, I don't know if they said what it was, but we're talking hundreds of a second, right? They were talking about the distance they had traveled from the car and the, the amount of feet that is, but I, that's all happening. If you watch that video in real time, that's all happening really quick, like within a second or a second and a half, which is very fast. 
Right. So, so right. So the, the, the taser was shot the officer. And of course you have to allow for some reaction time, hmm. right? He puts the taser away, draws his revolver and shoots not simultaneously, but sort of in a simultaneous reaction. Yeah. That's kind of what I saw. Okay. Well, you're not allowed to shoot someone in the back when they're fleeing, are you? Well, that depends. Okay. <laughs> so once again, I, even the district attorney, when you watch that, he had some of the case law from the Supreme Court on there, the most famous one, which is Tennessee v. Gardner, and that's where the shooting uh, a fleeing felon uh, came from. And just so your audience knows, uh, Tennessee v. Gardner happened over uh, – a suspect who was jumping over a fence that was fleeing the Memphis police, I believe. Uh, I think it was Memphis. And uh, he had committed some burglaries in the area. And as he was jumping to get away uh, over a fence, one of the officers shot uh, the suspect in the back. And so that went all the way to the Supreme Court because they're saying, hey, he wasn't a threat. He's running away. Um, and I think there was some type of an active fight during that. I can't quite remember. Anyway, that's where it came from. And that sets up the guidelines for when you can use lethal force on a subject who's running away from you. And there's specific things like that. They have to be an active threat or a danger to other people and the officers, or by not affecting the arrest, by letting them get away, it puts people in danger because you haven't taken them into custody. Um, so there are very specific guidelines uh, on that. All right. But I heard the DA say that the officer, the officer did the shots, officer Ralph, knew, and I'm not sure how he uses information, that the officer knew that the taser had been fired twice and therefore would not be dangerous. Do you remember, did you hear him say that? I did hear him say that. And so the thing is, and I don't know where he's coming from that because I'm not privy to all that information. Obviously we aren't, but there's two tasers involved. Now, which taser has been fired, which one hasn't. Um, so the taser works in two ways. Uh, it can be used as a touch stun without a cartridge on it. And they actually have a little plastic cartridge that goes on the tip of it. And that's what holds the prongs that shoot out. Once that has been shot out, uh, it can't be used again in that shooting fashion uh, unless the cartridge has been replaced with a new one. But the taser can still be used because you can still touch somebody with it. If you walk up to them, it's still going to tase them. And uh, modern tasers nowadays interrupt the central nervous system. So what they do is it's like having a, a telephone and you're talking to somebody through the line, which is your brain to your muscle system and your nerves and somebody cutting in that line in the middle and screaming. So it interrupts the communication from the brain to the biomechanical physical body. Um, and that's why you fall down. So it does too, it's pain compliance and it interrupts the central nervous system. So whether you get hit with the prongs or you get touched with it, it's doing that in the specific area it's touching. So going, going back to what you just said. So we saw that, uh, Brooks turned around and fired, and you saw the uh, prongs come out. Mm -hmm. right, we see on the tape. So was the officer in danger at that moment of serious bodily harm? At the time that he fired it, yes. yes. Okay. Now let's go to something that I know you wanted to talk about, and I mentioned this on my Facebook page to get reaction, and of course everybody just didn't want to talk about that, but you know whether the officer was guilty or not. Basically, if we're saying that the shooting was not justified by we, I mean the district attorney, the prosecution, we're saying that the taser did not represent a lethal weapon or something that uh, creates a danger of serious bodily injury, right? Yes. By de facto. Yet, two officers in Atlanta were charged with aggravated assault that included or involved what? A taser. Still a deadly weapon. Is that not yeah. the case in there? Yeah, well, a, a taser is classified as a less lethal, right? Less lethal by definition means there's, it could possibly cause death or serious bodily injury. I mean, if you look at tasers over the last 20 years now, I mean, the real prominent starting to use tasers happened, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, that's when they really started to become prolific in law enforcement. And after a few years, we started seeing fatalities from tasers. Now, whether it's excited delirium or, uh, you know, drug related things like that, uh, the taser has been identified as a contributing factor in a lot of those deaths. So it is a less lethal device. It's meant to hopefully not kill somebody and gain compliance, but it can kill you depending on your biomechanics. How does your heart operate? How does your central nervous system operate? What are the, you know, 
electrical impulses that you personally have. Um, and that's still a hard thing to study, but that's why just like your baton, the police ask for a baton, it's a less lethal device. If I hit you in the head with a baton, can you die? Absolutely. If a suspect takes my baton and starts hitting me in the head, am I justified in using lethal force? Absolutely, because he can either kill me or cause serious bodily injury. Um, so that's a pretty easy definition on that device. You can't have it one way or other. It can't be a non-threatening device here, but a lethal threatening device here. So it's either one or the other, and I think it's been classified across the nation as a less lethal device. Right. Several years ago, we had a situation here where police officers tased a young man and he died. And again, the media asked for my opinion. And I didn't say right or wrong. Obviously, you have to know the whole circumstances. But I at least posited the question, should we now at least consider the taser as a potential? excuse me, potentially lethal weapon. Because I think, as you said, most people say, oh, it's just non-lethal, and that means it can't kill you. But obviously it can kill you. Not likely to, and maybe not intended to, but it certainly has that possibility. Absolutely. Okay. So when I posted this question on Facebook, is this a fair application of the law? Meaning that in this interpretation, the officers used a deadly force vis-a-vis -vis a uh, taser. And now, well, it wasn't seriously body injury, seriously, serious bodily injury threat or deadly force a taser. Therefore, the shooting wasn't justified. Of course, everyone responded, they didn't care. It's just the officer needed to be prosecuted. Not everybody, but certainly the majority of people. But is that important that it's being applied uh, unfairly or unevenly when, when uh, to a police officer and then someone else? I think it's important. I mean, uh, anytime you apply the law, it needs to be applied consistently and in the same manner every single time, regardless of who you are right? Um, police officers aren't um, exempt from being prosecuted. Obviously, they can step out of their bounds. The thing is, are they applying the force that's being used uh, appropriately with what their training has been told and with the devices they're using and the threat that's being presented to themselves? And that's happening in a split second. Um, the, the use of force in law enforcement, it's all based off of like the district attorney said, reasonableness. Would a reasonable person, a reasonable officer, that's kind of what a lot of laws are based off of, right? And if things are happening that fast, law enforcement officers have been given the benefit of the doubt because they have to make a split second decision. And what happens down the road later, uh, as everybody's quarterbacking it and Monday morning quarterbacking it, um, doesn't matter in that split second what is presented to you at that specific time that you're basing your decision off of really quick um, is kind of that standard as it goes on. So I, I do think it's inherently dangerous to be wishy-washy with the application of the law because um, it has ramifications in the future and with civilians and with law enforcement officers. Well, I'm just thinking, um, if I'm the defense attorney for the officer, first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grab those, at, those warrants they claim the officers use deadly force vis-a-vis -a, -vis a taser and say, hey, you you already determined before this happened that this is potentially deadly force. Why is that not being applied to my client? Yeah, I mean, you know, the district attorney has a job to do. Uh, and he's his job is to pre present a case that he thinks that he can win, just like a defense attorney. Bring cuts. You know, there's a little bit of art. Uh, you've been to court, you know, and, and cases probably multiple times as well. There's an art to it, right? They're presenting the case um, as they see uh, fit. So just like uh, Mr. Brooks being placed under arrest, the standard for um, prosecuting somebody, right, is still at that. It's it's beyond. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a hundred percent. That's a conviction, right? To arrest somebody, it's probable cause, which is uh, 50 fifty percent, maybe a little less than fifty percent, right? The same thing with getting an indictment on somebody. You're just saying it's basically more reasonable than not that maybe this happened, which is a 50% threshold. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of expert witnesses on both sides, and they're basically going to articulate, you know, this is the case law that's been handed down from the Supreme Court on when they can and when they can't use force and was it applied appropriately. And they're going to also say they had a threat. They were involved in an active fight a physical confrontation you know uh, how do the officers feel it is super important at that time um are they fatigued do they think that they can't continue anymore i mean even somebody that's in relatively good shape 
the all out fight and physical exertion, a normal human being can only do that for two to three minutes at most, the average person, you know, somebody who's a boxer or a championship MMA fighter, that's why they build up those tolerances. But you notice those rounds are still only two or three minutes and then they got to rest. Otherwise they're going to be so physically fatigued. So if they're getting punched in the face and they're fatigued, that all pays a contributing factor in what use of force they're going to use in their mind, right? What, what, what do they think is the appropriate use of force or is somebody in danger if they get away? I mean, clearly, even though Mr. Brooks fired that taser and turned around again, he never dropped it. He was going to continue running with it. He still has that weapon in his hand, whether it is or not. And I can't say what those officers are thinking. I look in that video and I kind of think about what I would have been thinking being in that position. I know that they said that they conducted a preliminary pat down and he had something and they took his word for it, that it was money or whatever that was but i don't know if the officer in his head i'd be thinking crap is that my taser that he has or did he just pull out a gun i mean it's dark things are happening like that he sees a spark of light that the officer believe he was fired upon i mean i don't know these are all things that will come up in the court case that have to be articulated by the defense and the prosecution obviously clarify duncan so after he shot at the officer with the taser that taser could have been used again on another officer or, or on anybody yeah, it could, if the, t if the prongs had been deployed, it couldn't be used at a distance with the prongs, but it could still be used to run up on them and get in a fight and tase the person by, by making contact with them. So do you think, again, just your professional opinion, and that's all it is, your professional opinion, someone in that state of mind who's already exhibited this kind of violence towards police officers, uh, no fear of going, you know, mano a mano with them, mm -hmm. running away with a taser, is he a danger to society? Well, you, I think you have to presume as the officer that he's an imminent and continuing danger because if you're continuing to pursue that person, are, is, there, is their use of force going to continue to go up? Is he now going, hey, this thing I took isn't work, so now I need to actually try and get the officer's gun? Um, he's intoxicated, number one. They know that because that's the original basis for them going to arrest him is because he's DUI. Um, so what's his state of mind? We don't know. I would say he's a danger because he's actively resisting. He's running out of the environment. Is he going to run out on the road? I mean, you're kind of, you are as weird as it sounds, you're responsible for his safety too. If he runs out in the street and gets hit by a car because you weren't able to get the handcuffs on him and, and stop the fight. Well, I mean, you're responsible for that too. It's kind of a no win situation for the law enforcement officer. Yeah, right? it and uh, it's, it's always a bad outcome in those situations. Right. You know, I, and, and people are using the term lawful, but awful. And yeah. that may be so. But putting aside, I know the key issue here, of course, is the use of force. But up until that point mm -hmm. of firing the weapon, I think you and I both agree the officers were handling it correctly. They're making a lawful arrest and they weren't escalating merely by placing him under arrest. And they weren't escalating by chasing him after he broke free with their yeah, weapon. No, I mean, yeah, absolutely. They up until the use of the deadly force, as I see it. They were doing exactly what they've been trained, which I was trained on, which you were trained on. Um, I was. I would, honestly, I would have been in the same situation. Yeah. Go free, I would have been chasing him. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said something that I always think about with police work about Monday morning quarterbacking. And I think outside of the quarterback himself, uh, police officers are probably Monday morning quarterback more than almost any other profession. And you know, I was a police officer 40 years ago. I stepped, I stepped out for my first day as a police officer. And I was only a cop for three years uh, before I joined the FBI. And then those years of the FBI, of course, um, I was always on a task force with police or in my management years, having task forces under my command. And tasers, I never handled a taser. They weren't on the street when I was there. Uh, based on the timeline you gave, they became popular during, during my waning years in the FBI. So I don't have the expertise to talk about tasers. But given my experience, I know that I give the benefit of the doubt to police officers. I know emotionally, you know, I want to defend them, you know, when I can. And so, you know, I have that bias. Uh, so I, I'm just thinking, you know, when I try to think about these things, and I hear all these Monday morning quarterbacks, so he should have done this, he should have done that, he knew this, he knew that, or he should have known that. I'm thinking, how do you know? If you've never been in those shoes, you've never experienced that fear of, you know, if your life might be in danger, or, you know, or, or, or a subject of serious injury, or as you said, you do something wrong that results in someone else getting hurt. If you haven't been there, how do you know what you would have done 
And how do you know what that officer should have done? And I really think, I mean, you and I are just talking heads now, but at least we're talking from some experience. Uh, and just giving our opinion. Our opinion is a court of public opinion. It has no bearing on them. But for the public to become so outraged at everything police do these days, I think is wrong. A lot of wrong going on. No one is, no one is uh, protecting Officer Chauvin. Nobody's standing up for him. Uh, the, I remember the shooting down in South Carolina, Mr. Scott. I thought the officer had lost his mind when, when he shot him from, from fleeing. Yeah. No one's saying that all these officers are all correct, but they're not all wrong. And I'm not even talking about Officer Rolf here, but I'm just saying the hostility that we seem to have for officers now, I think is going to be detrimental to the administration well, of justice as we move on. And I think, you know, we kind of talked offline, and I think uh, one thing that you had told me was, you know, the concern was, what does this mean for the future of law enforcement? I think we're talking about the appropriate and uh, application of the laws, right? And always being on the same standard, regardless of who you are. Um, when you define something as not an item here, and then define it as the exact same item as something different over here, you're not you're not consistently applying that um, term or that law. And I think what that gives to officers that are out there is it's kind of whoever's in charge at the time is going to make a decision and may not necessarily have the best interest of the officer or anybody else and kind of swing to public opinion. And that puts a bad taste in people's mouths. And I think a lot of people end up saying, hey, I don't want to do that profession. And it has ramifications when we make mistakes like that. Obviously, listen, officers across the nation, they're people and they make mistakes. I made mistakes. So there's no way you don't make mistakes, right? Um, it's how bad of mistakes you have that is the difference. There are bad apples out there. Um, I think in totality, police officers in the nation are some of the best people you know, in this nation. Uh, and they don't get a lot of credit. And I don't think they deserve or they want to get all the credit, right? But it's a tough job. And those people that haven't been in shoes, like you said, a lot of those people that Monday morning quarterback have never been punched in the face because you know what? They live in a great country where they don't right. see those things. Um, they don't know what it's like. Heck, I had guys I worked with that were cops when we were on the street and they had never been in a fight in their entire lives. And even the police officer, your trainers will tell you all the time, you don't know how you're going to react until it happens to you, right? I've seen officers just freeze. They have all this training. They've been on four or five years. They've been exposed to a ton of stuff. And then somebody punches them in the face and they go into fight or flight and they lock up and they don't know what to do. You really don't know what you're going to do until it happens. And sometimes you overplay your hand and you miscalculate and you make the wrong decision. Um, and there's, when we're dealing with deadly force and things like that, that can happen and you can make a big mistake um, and you're liable for that, obviously. But uh, I think with all sorts of events that are going on in law enforcement, probably over the last 10 or 15 years, right? The, the amount of people that are applying for that job anymore has gone down great, drastically. You know, I know police departments are having a hard time filling academies, you know, and getting people because people see that. They're like, do I really want to do that? Do I want to be second guessed all the time? No matter what I do, it's going to be wrong. And you're just not going to get people that are going to apply for that. And I think that's going to be a huge issue going on for decades to come. Yeah, you know, one of my sons uh, thought about being a police officer. And of course, being having been law enforcement, I thought it'd be a great career. He decided against it. And now I, I, my wife and I were just talking last night. We're saying how glad we are he's not out there you know, in this environment. Uh, we just fear for his safety. We fear for his, uh, you know, the, the reputation he would have or not have with amongst the friends because he's just by having that uh, uniform on. It's going to be tough. And as you said, we don't want people taking this job just because it's the best job they could get. You know, we want people motivated, you know, since they were little kids saying, I want to help people. I want to be there for them. I want to be a police officer. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's a tough thing. I, you know, I think the public doesn't understand what the day-to-day call to call is. And I think we, I think we need to do a better job of educating the public on what actual law enforcement is in this day and age, what you're expected to do, what it's expected. You're expected to wear all the hats, every single one of them. Um, you know, I remember, you know, your people, you get upset. I remember specifically times where it's like, I just got done doing CPR on an infant that didn't make it, right? So it's my first hour of that day. I get called to 
a non-breathing baby. I'm CPR certified. I got a DFib. I've got all this training. I go there. I mean, when you're a 25 year old guy, a 30 year old guy, and I consider that a fail, right? I couldn't save the baby. The baby died, but guess what? Now you need to go back out and you need to start doing some traffic, right? And then the first car you stop for speeding 15 over, you go up there and you're like, Hey, you know, you were speeding and they're immediately like, how dare you stop me? Don't you have anything else better to do? Well, you know, that officer is still dealing with, I just watched an infant die in front of me, right? And now I've got this person yelling at me who's, you know, I'm just trying to conduct a traffic stop, right? And the next call you have right after that is the husband who beat the crap out of his wife, you know, and then you got to see that and you got to see the kids or a child abuse case. So, I mean, this is just a nonstop you know, eight hour day, 10 hour day, depending on where you're at, it's call to call to call like that. And so over years that weighs on you and police may take, uh, you know, action based on their gut feeling sometimes the experience of being exposed to those things all, all the time. I mean, I, you probably know, I knew when somebody was going to fight me, I mm -hmm. could tell I mean, the, the second that you touch their hand, their body tenses up. That's something you can't see on video. You can't see the the strain and the muscle on the video, right? And you just know, and that just comes with experience. And to other people, it may look like, wow, that cop was really excessive. But you kind of get that gut feeling of like, you know what? If I if I just use a little bit more force, which you're allowed to do, right? If somebody's presenting fists to you, you present a baton or you right. present a taser. You, if the force continuum is always one step above what their force is. So if somebody's yelling and screaming at me and pinching their fists up and, and looking like they're going to fight me, well, I'm going to grab them and throw them on the ground. That's not excessive. I want to use as much, but as least as possible to affect the arrest and calm everything down. And that's just how you can't teach it. It's just something well, you know, that comes you, with experience. You make a great point. There are a couple of things I want to mention uh, about instinct. Uh, cheap, cheap, uh, Add here for my book, but in my first book, and I, I talk about some stories. And I remember when I was a rookie cop, maybe a year on, still pretty young. I was only 23, maybe 24 years old. Mm -hmm. I remember a situation where we had a, this young man was just acting wildly in the streets. It appeared almost like he'd been drugged or OD'd on something and took something he didn't expect, but totally out of control. A couple of officers rushed him to the ground and they said, all right, are you going to calm down when we let you up? And he says, yes, yes. Just my instinct. I knew he was going to break bad. And I knew he was going to come after me. Why? I don't know. But I said, he's coming after me. So we did. And when he did, of course, I was ready for him. And um, you know, I just got him down quickly and was able to put him under control. And I didn't get hit or anything. And the officers asked me, uh, do you want to press charges for attempt to assault a police officer? I said, no, I don't want to press charges for, for that. Just take him in. But again, it was instinct. It was instinct. Yeah. The other point you make, though, is it has to come with the use of force. And I think this is really important because... I hear people say things all the time that are not correct. The officer could only use the exact force used against him. Mm -hmm. Not correct. No, no. Our force no. is used to overcome the resistance. Exactly. Overcome. Again, it goes back to that theory you and I discussed. You have to win. The police officer has to win. Or if, if we're constantly to back off, the system will fall apart. So it's a constant continuum. You, you uh, give more force. They give more force. It increases. And I was mm -hmm. told as a rookie cop, you may make a traffic stop one day on a very minor offense that may end up in you shooting somebody. That does not necessarily mean you were wrong. You may be, but not necessarily, because the minor offense isn't the reason they were shot. The reason yeah. they were shot is what happened afterwards, how, why it es how it escalated, and what was happening at the moment. Uh, yeah. Right, because so it's not, you know, people, then you know, people think, oh, a cop can't shoot till he's shot at, or he can't hit someone till he's hit first. This is not correct. They're allowed to protect themselves and allowed to, uh, taking offensive action under the yes. threat of physical force, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's why there's a thing called the force continuum. It tells you the appropriate steps that you're supposed to be at based on the force that's presented, you know, against you. And, you know, I, like I said, I think we need to do a better job of maybe educating the public to let them know. I mean, it's not okay, you know, to run away from the police and assault the police. I mean, that, those are criminal offenses if they legitimately are there to affect a lawful arrest. I mean, you kind of just have to go with it. The, the, the time to fight what you may perceive as an injustice is in court, not 
a right. physical fight on the street, right? That's not, that doesn't help anybody. That actually makes the problem worse. Um, you know, hey, Duncan, when you were a police school. officer, did your department have the Citizens Academy? They did, and they still do now. And, you know, my wife at the time went through it. Uh, I think those are the great outreach programs because people see what that mundane day-to-day -day operation is of going from call to call and call and things like that. But once again, that, that only gives a small segment of the population because they're doing background checks on the people that are going through those classes. They don't just let anybody do it because you are, you are seeing how law enforcement conducts tactics and the type of things that they use. And so there's still a segment of the population that's never going to see that because they're not going to be able to pass the requirement to go to those classes. But you know, the more people that can go to that and then can tell their friends who have no idea um, what the, you know, day-to-day -day operations are like, I think those are great things. And I think we need to do more of that and presenting that. I think that will help people understand, you know, and unfortunately media is a big problem because media, in my opinion, is a lot of times they're there just to present the bad of the bad because that's the ratings, you know, and they don't present um, a balanced uh, narrative on what really happens. It's like the thing that you said is, you know, you stopped a car and a traffic stop made to lead to a shooting. You know, a lot of times when the media represents those, like, well, he was shot for speeding. No, he wasn't. He was stopped for speeding. He did something that made it escalate to that, right? And so I think they need a better job of, you know, media and everybody. You know, that's why these platforms are great. People like you that have experience and talk on the news and try and give your, you know, expertise, opinion to educate people. I think that's the biggest thing is educating people on what it really is, what is expected of you, right? The police pretty much know what's expected of them. I'm not sure the general public sometimes knows what's expected. Of them. They should. They should expect you to be like, hey, you know, if I just do what they say at this particular point and be calm, it's going to work out much better for that person than fighting. Fighting's never the answer. Right. No, just, and I think sorry, go this whole situation that we've been talking about with Mr. Brooks, 100% avoidable if he just goes, you know what, it's been 40 minutes of me being nice and them being nice to me and talking and figuring this out. Just put the handcuffs on, right? It's another 40 minutes of paperwork or whatnot, and I'll have my day, I'll be at home. That's the best outcome that you would want, and then this wouldn't happen, you know? I think there's a narrative nowadays that people are like, oh, the police are just out there to get us and kill us, you know, or <laughs> whatever. And if that's the case, then everybody would be afraid of the police. And I think there would be more instances of police stepping out of line if that's the case. I think these are very small, small population, just like the criminal population. It's very small. It's that 1% of continuous recycled people. You know, it's not 90% of the people that's out of control. So numbers and statistics matter. Yeah, I want to get back on the Citizens Academy. In the FBI <laughs> Citizens Academy, uh, also great success as with police departments. Uh, our last day or night, actually, in the evening was the shoot, don't shoot scenario. And we, know we had that very old technology, but it really worked pretty well. Yeah. Uh, we could change the outcome and people got their little gun, you know, shot out a laser or whatever. And they saw, wow, it's not what they thought. Yeah. Right? It's not that easy to make a decision in that second. How many of them walked away having been shot? And they walked away realizing that there might be an appropriate time to shoot somebody in the back. It in a, of itself is not wrong. It, it may be, and it certainly uh, on the surface it sounds wrong, but it may not be wrong given the, given the uh, the events. So those are really great outreach because then we ask them to go out and be our emissaries to the community. So when something ha bad happens, an agent looks bad or a cop looks bad. If they're wrong, they're wrong. But if it's not so clear, explain to your friends and your neighbors. Here's what I learned in the Citizen Academy. Don't be so quick to judge. Um, so let's go again to, he was shot, Mr. Brooks was shot in the back. You know, social media is saying, that's it, case closed. Your response? Well, I mean, it's a dynamic situation. There's multiple uh, ways somebody can get shot in the back. I mean, just the dynamic movement of, of you know, the officer coming out and making the decision that he's going to fire his weapon takes you know, time, reaction time for your brain to recognize this is what I should do. Now I need to affect that action. That all takes hundreds of seconds, you know, three, three hundredths of a second. It keeps going on at that time. Your brain makes the decision for you to pull the trigger. That could be the time that the person decides to spin away from you. 
and de facto, your brain's already made that decision. There's really no way of taking it back at that point. Things happen so quickly that you could get shot in the back. From seeing the video that I recall seeing, he was it appeared that he was full on running away at the time that the shots were fired is what they're saying because I can't really see them. Um, so I'm just going off of the extra information that we got today. And, but once again, that's where we have to apply the case law from the Supreme court that dictates during this chain of events. Is there enough communicate, communi communication or, uh, can't really say that, uh, a cumulative, uh, amount, amount of, threat that has come in this incident that would justify that you know uh, what happened before the cameras are on and what happened after the cameras on you know may or may not affect that outcome but you have to have that snip in time of this is what's being presented at that specific time um, I think looking at all of that uh, just from the video evidence that we can see I mean, it could go either way, depending on what's presented in court. That's my opinion. Um, the chain of events that I saw, and I think, you know, we've talked about this earlier, and with all the people that I know, they're still in law enforcement that I interact with today in my other job, uh, is most of them are pretty much on the, hey, like, that's what we were taught. And I probably would have done the same thing in that situation. Um, and you can't really say that for sure because you're not in that situation. You don't have the feelings of what are going on at the time. You can kind of guess like, oh, I, I used to feel like that when that happened. But unless you're actually involved in that specific incident, you kind of don't really know 100% what you're going to do. You can say, hey, yeah, I'm 75, 80, 95% sure what I would have done. Um, you know, there's parts of that video at the very beginning when they're on the ground and the officers are getting punched in the face. I could, in my mind, go, you know what, that might have been the time to start amping up the use of force even more, right? And maybe that would have stopped it, or maybe that wouldn't. So, you know, I kind of, I'm erring on the side of how fast the events happened and how quickly there were. I kind of think at the time, the officer felt that he's justified in, in taking that action. You know, and I think there is case law in other cases that would support that, uh, clearly. Right. And let's go back to something. And then I want to get into some things that DA said. I hear a lot of, oh, the officer knew this. And people said, oh, but he had a backup officer there. He knew the gunman fired. At that moment, how much does the officer, and I'm not even talking about this officer per se, but in this situation, how much does the officer know when he's making that decision? Well, I mean, you know, you're getting into psychological issues that have been studied by the FBI and the ATF and, and countless uh, agencies on the uh, what happens in your brain in these use of force type incidents, right? And how, you know, you get that tunnel vision or time is perceived to slow down. I mean, I've had things like that happen to me. And so um, I can understand that at the time of the incident, sometimes the officer doesn't know everything that's happening, you know, uh, that's why usually on a, on a severe use of force, they usually isolate those officers, right? And don't talk to them because they want them to sit there and recall everything that happened, you know, and you probably know just watching uh, um, interrogations and interviews um, over the years that there's a lot of times they'll interview an officer and they'll say, do you know how many rounds you fired? And they'll be like, I, I fired two, maybe three rounds. Right. And then they go look at the video and the guy fired 16 times. He has no idea. Once he fired those first two rounds, his brain basically starts shutting things off. And that's like, it's a self-preservation. There's only so much information that you, your brain can decipher in a traumatic event when your heart rate's 160 beats a minute, right? When your heart rate gets that high, it actually deprives your brain of thinking about certain things because you're in a fight or flight. And it's using everything it can for the gross muscle skills for you to survive a deadly encounter, right? So to know exactly what he knows at that time, I can't say. I don't think he could say it probably. Um, sometimes they have to see it. the video. Yeah, We expect him to remember everything that happened within the first five minutes there after having uh, all this occurred, you know, fight, fight and flight. Yep. And all that. Can he really, does he really remember, oh yeah, my office is up, my partner's over here, and if this happens, he'll save me. Is that reasonable to put all these expectations in his thought process? 
at the moment of being fired at with a taser. Yeah, no, it, it goes out the window. I mean, you, your brain stops thinking about certain things that like at that time, it just basically starts thinking about self-preservation. You know, now I'm not an expert on that. That's just what I've been told in trainings and classes and, and seeing things over, you know, the years. Okay. So I want to, you know, as we get to the end here, talk about a couple things. I'm getting the impression, and I think I'm correct, that up until this point where we've discussed everything that happened, you feel that the officer at least may have been justified in, in his... In, up to a certain point, he was absolutely justified. Um, you know, the... I, and that's only based off the little bit of information I have. They could have information. Obviously, a district attorney does not take uh, prosecuting someone lightly. Like, they have to feel pretty confident that they have a strong case. So there's there could be... Uh, like you said, there was cell phone video from private citizens. I mean, that could have shown a different angle or a different something or the interaction afterward that none of us have seen. So um, I, I think what we've seen that has been presented in the video evidence that we've kind of seen, uh, me and you, I, I do believe the officers were justified up to a certain point. But I do also know, as well as you know, hey, there have been officers that have been convicted because the first two rounds were justified, but the third one wasn't, right? And that doesn't sit well with people sometimes, but those things have happened where, yeah, clearly the first two rounds the officers fired, totally justifiable, and then the third round was found not to be, right? And those are things that have to be, uh, you know, squared out at court, you know, in court, and that's why we have a court process, a trial. you know what I mean? Right. Now, the That's DA it. gave us some information, and of course, as you and I know, he's under no obligation, and it probably wouldn't be wise for him to tell us everything he knows. No. So he, he might be acting with a lot of information we don't have. Absolutely. But let's I'll go a couple of things. So now, there's a statement that the officer made after she, I got him. And the DA played that out as some indicia of his mindset, being somewhat vindictive. How do you see it? Well, I mean... It's based off of what they presented. It could have been vindictive and it could have just been, you know, him saying, I got him, I hit him. You know, I fired the gun, I've shot him. Uh, who knows what that means? Uh, there would have to be a lot more investigation. I'm sure, you know, obviously he has a lawyer, but I'm sure they're going to want to talk to him at some point and say, can you clarify that statement? You know, what was that? Or his lawyer is going to have to present a this is the clarification for what that is. And that's why he used that technical term and excited utterance, right? The excited utterance is your brain just said something out loud. Um, and that, those are admissible in court. Everybody knows in our professions that excited utterance is an admissible statement in court. It's what did it actually mean? I don't know what it means. It could have meant, hey, I got him. He was getting away. I got him. Or, hey, I shot him. He was telling him his partner. I've hit him with, you know, my rounds. I don't know what it means, uh, so I can't really say. But that could be an either-or statement. It could be very uh, damning. And it could be, uh, you know, not. But now we also see this picture. Uh, he's, uh, the DA claims that the officer then kicked Mr. Brooks after he was down, shot him down. And he showed a picture of what certainly looked to be the officer winding up for that kick. Uh, you know, that looked like I was happening. How do we explain that in the context of everything that happened? Well, I think, I think that's another, you know, let's, so let's take the excited utterance of him saying, I got him. Right. And then now let's go to uh, this thing saying that, you know, he was going to kick him. And then he even said more that I guess the partner stood on his shoulders. I didn't see any of those. I didn't stick around long enough for that. I had something else going on, but what I think the DA is trying to do there is is link a chain of events that gives a totality of what, what the mindset was. And he's trying to articulate that the mindset was like a punitive, right? Or, or vindictiveness, right? And so I think he's making the inference that, you know, the, the I got him is a negative statement because then he went to kick him or, or the partner stood on him. And I don't know, you know, those, those are things that, also, the heat of a moment, did the officer let, you know, the emotions of the event get to him too much? Uh, was the guy trying to get back up? And that's why, you know, he kicked him. I don't know. Is he kicking him because he thinks he's going to get back up and he doesn't want to shoot him again? Like, that would probably be a positive if you look at it one way. Like, would we rather shoot him again or kick him to keep him down? You know, because at that point, 
that's a de-escalation, right? But you would have to know that that was his intent. I don't think it's been articulated that that was his intent. So it's another could go either way. But when you start spooning those things together and that little mound of evidence gets a little higher because of that, then it could be the prosecution saying we we're charging because of all this uh, in the totality. around the incident stuff. Yeah. So in your, in your opinion, it's just your opinion. Is it possible that I know everything's possible, but is, you know, is it feasible that the officer could have been responding inappropriately with that kick, you know, just begin be let the emotions get the best of him, which you shouldn't do, but yet still have made a justifiable shooting. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You know, um, you know, the whole definition of first responder nowadays is you have to, it's hard, but you have to know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And so if you've used the deadly force and the person's down on the ground, now it's time to render aid, you know, or uh, start calming the situation down, right? So absolutely, there, there are multiple cases that you can probably look up where the officers shot somebody right? And it's been totally justified or you used other type of deadly force and it's been totally justified, but then used inappropriate force afterwards by kicking somebody or slapping somebody because they're angry, you know, or throwing them on the ground afterwards because they couldn't control their emotions because of the incident. So yes, you can be justified and unjustified in additional uses of force. That absolutely, that's totally acceptable and reasonable as well. Right. I think uh, given, uh, you know, the kick, the statement, and the state of affairs and publicity, I think it's going it's to be a very tough defense for this officer. What are your thoughts? I, I think it is going to be a tough defense. And, you know, uh, the bad, well, I guess it's not a bad thing. You know, with social media, with the amount of press that's in, involved in all of these things, right, that puts pressure on everybody right? It puts pressure on the DA. It puts pressure on the police department. It puts pressure on the mayor. And I mean, you've already seen those pressures. The, you know, chief resigned, right? Shortly after this incident, the mayor's making statements. You know, the DA is obviously going to uh, push forward with, with a prosecution now. And so they need to do the best job that they can. And, and part of that is the appropriate charges based off of what they're trying to accomplish, right? Uh, we have seen cases in the past where they overcharged and then the whole case got thrown out because they didn't leave any lesser offenses in there that were an option, right? So they have to be careful with that so that they don't uh, mishandle the case and make people even more upset who feel that this wasn't justified or it was justified, right? It's, a, it's kind of, unfortunately to say, it's a big political and media game at that point, you know, um, with the art of court, as we know. So I don't know. It, I still have the opinion that it could go either way. A lot of these cases have gone either way. We've, we've had cases where we're like, hey, man, this guy is straight up guilty. There is no way he's getting off and then they get off. Right. And that's just as bad as this guy's totally innocent. I can't believe this is what's happening. And then they find him guilty. Right. Uh, I think it could kind of go both ways. Uh, interesting thing is I believe in the news conferences right when I got off, I think they said that the, I'm not sure you might be able to tell me that the backup officer that didn't fire actually made a statement probably about the kick or some other things. I'm not sure if I, I you heard that to him or not. made a statement and he's willing to testify. I don't yeah. Know. And so exactly. that's another piece of that pile, right? That starts making you go, well, you know, there was some inappropriate conduct like after the fact or not, you know, depending on how that goes. So, uh, you know, it's interesting having a little bit more information. So I think the dialogue we've had today has changed just a little bit based off the new amount of information that we've got today, because now we can see there might have been some other things happening that we didn't even know about. So, right. As we said, we don't really know the facts. Um, that's out there. We don't know what was in the officer's mind. All this will be for the jury to decide. I think there's some mitigating circumstances. I think there's some aggravating Yes. I think some of this evidence today is, is very damning. But I'm going to go out on the limb here uh, and tell you this. You know, I, I'm kind of a left leaner. I'm not a great believer in excessive use of force. Uh, but based on my years as a police officer, which were a long time ago, and in the Bureau, I was on the street for 10 years. The second half was in management. 
But I believe that if I was an officer chasing someone and they turned and shot anything at me, any projectile, I think I would have returned gunfire. That's just my feeling. I, I would have as well. Um, you know, and those are the split second uh, type of things. I, I have been involved in incidents where somebody had turned around and I thought they had a weapon and I was on the trigger, right? And by the grace of God, something happened and the person dropped it. And then later I found out it was a toy, mm -hmm. right? But I had already made that decision. I was about to do it. And two one hundredths of a second later, I might have fired that round, right? And those are common occurrences, believe it or not. Those things happen on a daily basis. And so uh, it worked out for me in that particular situation. For somebody else, it might not have. And so, but I do believe generally with the training that you get and when those type of things are presented to you, you know, you, you're training people to, yes, that, that's the appropriate response is if you think somebody's going to have that type of lethal force against you, you had better, you know, start presenting lethal force to them. Otherwise you're not going to make it home. <laughs> so I, I agree with you presented with some of those situations. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's how you're trained. So I know that could go into the other conversation, which you won't have about police reform and the culture of police work and all those other things. But for the moment, we want to look at this case. I don't think you could have done a better job of breaking it down and giving us some great insight, Duncan. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any closing thoughts for the audience before we sign well, up? I mean, you know, police reform, what you were talking about, police is constantly reforming. You know, you're talking about your career. I mean, think about what law enforcement was like 40 years ago versus 30 years ago versus 20 years ago versus 10 years ago. And police constantly have to adjust. They constantly have to get new tactics. Um, you know, there's the post civil rights law enforcement where the federal government came in and said, you will have police academies. So those are federal mandates. You will have a required amount of training. Right. And then you have the eighties law enforcement and then you get into, you know, pre Rodney King, post Rodney King. That's a big reform. Uh, police totally operate. I worked with some of those guys pre and post and they're, they're different characters. Right. Um, when you get into the 2000s, law enforcement turned into, you know, more community policing and outreach um, and, and things like that. So I think law enforcement is constantly trying to adapt and overcome um, what's presented to them. And it's very tough. It's a thankless, you know, profession. Some people just don't like police. That's just how it is because you're representing authority. Some people don't like that. Um, it's just unfortunate to have events like this happen over and over and over. And then some of them get blown out of proportion wrongly. And then some of them get blown out or blown up uh, appropriately. Right. And it's hard to decipher for the lay person, what is a good action and what isn't bad, what is bad action? Because at the end of the day, all physical force by police is that is it, that's it. It's physical force. It's not fun. It's not good, right? Uh, anytime the police have to use force, whether it's justified or unjustified, it all looks bad because you're affecting harm on somebody to get them to comply with what you want to do. And so it's, it's dirty by nature, right? but you kind of have to be able to decipher the good dirty from the bad dirty. If that makes any sense. Right. So it's, it's a very tough, uh, tough thing. So hopefully we will continue to have men and women uh, that have the intestinal fortitude to step up to that job and be willing to do it. You know? Yeah. I think we should, I think we'd agree that no matter how much a video we see, no matter how much we know or think we know, and considering our own biases that we all have, we don't know the whole story. And even in a jury, we may never hear the whole story, but they'll hear most more than anybody else. And whatever their decision is, we have to live by it because they have heard all the evidence presented by the defense, presented by the prosecution, and how to, in, just like an officer, how to make a decision based on their best judgment. Absolutely. Thank you, Duncan. It was great having you. I'm, I'm sure we're gonna, I'm going to call upon you again, so don't go too far, my friend. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great always being on and, and picking each other's brains. I, I, I enjoy it, and hopefully this reaches some people and it helps them make a decision on things that happen. So. Or at least to keep an open mind and consider some of the things that they may not have considered before. Absolutely. Well, they, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you listened uh, to what Duncan had to say. I think he gave us some great insight and a lot of things to think about. And we'll see you next time on Crimes and Times.